All right, so chapter 15 is our end of our fiscal period work, permanent financial statements. We went through in chapter 14 and did our worksheet. Our worksheet is our first financial statement that we do at the end of the fiscal period, but it's not a permanent financial statement. Permanent financial statements would be the ones that would go in an annual report. So we prepare a worksheet to make sure all of our accounts and everything is ready to go for our permanent one. So the first permanent financial statement that we're going to do is an income statement. But we've done those before, haven't we? An income statement? Not, it is a little bit different because we are a merchandising business. Remember when I sell you these monitors? Okay, if the monitor costs $150, that's not $150 profit. We have to deal with the cost of goods sold. So when we do our income statement, that tends to be the trickiest part for this test, is the cost of goods sold, is remembering the order of what we need to do. Remember our account merchandise inventory on our trial balance. Okay? When we buy products throughout our fiscal period, what account do we use? Purchases. So anytime we get new items we're going to turn around and sell to the customer, it does not go into merchandise inventory. It goes into purchases. So our merchandise inventory account is the amount of our inventory on January 1st, assuming that our fiscal period is January 1st to December 31st. Does that make sense? So at the start of our fiscal period, merchandise inventory is what our, mer our merchandise is, the, the value of our inventory. Throughout the fiscal period, when we buy more items, it goes into this count right here, purchases. Now, purchases has two cost accounts. What are they? Or contra accounts, excuse me. Purchases, yep. Yes, purchases, returns, allowance. Purchases has a debit balance, purchases, returns, and allowance, and purchases discount has a credit balance. Those two take away from the value of purchases. So what would I do with purchases to merchandise inventory? Would I add or subtract it? Add. add. So the beginning inventory, I'd add my purchases. And then if I need to find out what the cost of all of my products that I sold this fiscal year would be, beginning inventory plus my purchases, where I've subtracted out my two contras. Does that make sense? And then I'm going to subtract my ending inventory. Because these two over here, merchandise inventory and purchases, gives me the total value of all products for my entire fiscal period. Does that make sense? Then if I have my ending inventory, which they give us, because we use that as an adjustment, and I subtract from these two, that's going to give me the cost of all of my items I've sold. And that's going to be called your cost of goods sold. So think about it. If I take my sales minus my cost of goods sold, what does that give me? What he said. Say it. What did you say? Yeah, you did. Did you say profit? I'm hearing things. Say it louder, Jordan. Profit. Sales minus my cost of goods sold gives me my profit. It's no different than this $150 monitor, and I subtract my cost of goods sold, that gives me my profit. That is not my net income, though. Because what do I have to do to calculate net income? One more big category I need to deal with. Expenses. So, for example, when a customer comes in, I'm not going to charge them electricity because they walked in and I had the lights on. I'm not going to charge them because they went to the bathroom and used the paper towel in the bathroom. So you said pay toilets back in the yep, pay toilets. <laughs> I'm not going to charge them because I mopped the floor because they had muddy shoes on. Because I had employees in there, I don't charge them extra because they had three customer or three employees help them versus one. Would that, does that make sense? Like those are things that the business has to have in operation. So we have our sales minus our cost of goods sold, which we had those three parts, and then we're going to take from that is going to be our expenses. So our income statement is a lot more complicated, and right now it's really easy because it shows you which column to go in because we went from a two-column income statement to a three. Now let me tell you the reason why we have three columns. Your totals of your areas always need to be on the far right. 
Well, four columns. I can count today. No. Our totals for whatever heading always is going to be far right. When we need to do math or subtract and get different totals, it's going to move left, move up, and our total will always be to the right. The other thing that you're going to know is we also have that column called percent of sales. That's going to give us our component percentage. The component percentage is important because that allows us to relate numbers. So, for example, if I was going to open up a tech company, for me to compare my income statement to Apple, component percentages, I can compare the two very easily. Does that make sense? Apple's numbers are going to be gr greater. Would you agree? Volume of sales. Everything's going to be more. But I could, I could compare my component percentage for cost of goods sold to apples, and that gives me some information to see how I'm doing. There are going to be standard component percentages that different businesses are going to use based on their industry to see whether or not you're in line. Some businesses have greater expenses just due to the nature of the business. Service businesses oftentimes require greater expenses because you aren't giving them necessarily a product, so you have more expenses related with that. Some businesses have a higher cost of goods sold just because of the nature of the physical product they're selling. So we're going to prepare an income statement, and we're going to calculate and record our income statement for the following component percentages. Notice in the directions, it gives you component percentages that you need to fill in. Cost of goods sold, gross profit on sales, total expenses, net income before federal income tax, and it also does tell you to round your calculations to the nearest 1.1%. So they give you a completed worksheet that is very helpful. That's going to be where we get our numbers from. On the very top, let's go ahead and start with the name of our business, which is Interstate Tires. Name of our document is an income statement. And income statements are always prepared for the entire fiscal period, and this is for year ended December 31st. Now, we have three three main headings, revenue, cost of goods sold, and expenses. Before, we only had revenue and expenses. So the first heading that I'm going to put on here is going to be the word revenue followed by a colon. Basically, below revenue, we're going to go through and calculate what our sales is. And notice I say we have to calculate it because why? No, sales is really just going to be what customers give us. Not component percentage. We have some contra accounts. What are our contra accounts to sales? Sales allowances and sales discounts. So very much like purchases. So the first thing I'm going to put on here is the account sales. And that's going to go in the third column, and that's going to be 548, 989, 25. Below that, I'm going to say less sales discount with a colon. Sales discount is for six sixty one sixty nine, And then I'm also going to subtract sales returns and allowances. So I'm going to put those two numbers here. Okay? So... In this third column, I have my sales. In the second column, I have my sales discount and my sales returns and allowances. Notice, directly to the right of sales returns and allowances, I have another number. What we need to do with that is add up my sales discount and my sales returns and allowances. So the total of those two numbers is going to go directly below my sales. Now think about it. Why did I take these two numbers on the left-hand side, add them up, and put it right here? What do I need to do? Subtract, because I have the word less here. So I'm going to take my total sales, and I'm going to subtract the total of my discount and my returns and allowances, and where's that number going to go? Over on the right. And let me tell you, when you get your final, they're not going to have it where it shows you where the number goes. I'm telling you that right now. 
Okay, on the test for this chapter, your income statement, you're going to have an open spot in every single one of these. Okay. So now, what I need to do to calculate my next line down here, and that's going to say net sales, is I'm going to subtract these two numbers, 548,989.25 from 4174.53. That's going to give me 544,814.72. Okay. Do not do components percentages yet. We'll do those at the end. So heading number one that we just completed is revenue. The second section that we're going to do is called our cost of merchandise sold, followed by a colon. Remember when I was standing on the steps, what's the first thing that we need to know for our cost of merchandise sold? I was standing close to Michelle. No, not purchases, before purchases. We added purchases to it. Hmm. Hmm. When we buy items throughout the fiscal period, it goes into the account purchases. But when we start the fiscal period, where is the value of our inventory? Merchandise inventory. So we are going to start with... Now, let me tell you the heading. It is merchandise inventory January 1st, because this is the amount of our inventory when our fiscal year starts. And that is the number from trial balance. Because when I look at my worksheet, I have two different numbers here for merchandise inventory. I have trial balance and I have balance sheet. Right now, I am getting the amount for merchandise inventory from trial balance because that is the balance of my inventory on January 1st of that fiscal period. Now, I'm going to go through next and do my purchases. Purchases, we bought throughout the fiscal period 278,452.39. From that, I have to subtract less purchases discount and purchases returns and allowance. Very similar to what we did for sales. So I have my purchases discount and my purchases returns and allowance. I add these two numbers together and I get 5394.43. Again, I just added those two numbers together. It goes directly below purchases. So just like I did on sales, I have to subtract. Now, this is the heading that is most often missed and forgot. Okay? This is going to be called right here net purchases. So I'm going to take my purchases, subtract my discount and return to the allowance. It's going to give me 273.057.96. Now, here's my beginning inventory. It's supposed to be 273. I can't type today. How's that? Better? 273.057.96. Now, my beginning inventory and my net purchases, if I add those two together, beginning inventory and my net purchases, that is going to give me total cost of merchandise available for sale. And I'm really going to add those two numbers together. That's why they're lined up this way. So I'm going to add up my merchandise inventory on January 1st, 
plus my net purchases. That should give me 471, 538, 29. So throughout the whole entire fiscal period, that is my value of merchandise that I had available to all of my customers. I didn't necessarily have it all at the same time, but giving and taking throughout the year where we buy some, this is what I started with, I bought more, I bought more, I bought more, returned a little bit, bought more, returned a little bit, discounts, those types of things. That is truly what my business had to sell for this fiscal period. Okay? That is also a very tricky wording that people tend to miss on the test. Okay? So the total cost of merchandise available for sale. Now, what do you think I'm going to do with total cost of merchandise available for sale? What do I have to subtract? What's that? Remember I stood up here and I said, I have my beginning inventory. I have my purchases. I add those two together. That gives me my total merchandise available for sale. So what do I have to subtract? I'm going to subtract something to give me what I sold. Not sales, because sales has my markup on it. You're very close, though. I like what you're thinking. Nope, not anything with sales. Not income summary. It's close, though. What did we use for income summary? Merchandise inventory. We have to go back to that account. Okay. January 1st, the balance of merchandise inventory is what's in the trial balance. Now, the business goes through and does inventory. Remember, I talked about how important inventory is to a business. The, where is the value of inventory at the end of the fiscal period? It's on your, you have the information. Where is it? Balance on the balance sheet. So January 1st is on the trial balance. December 31st is on the balance sheet because we had to go through and adjust. And remember, the value of our merchandise inventory could go up or could go down, depending on if we bought more stuff. So what I'm going to do below total cost of merchandise available for sale is I'm going to say less merchandise inventory December 31st. And I'm going to get this number from the balance sheet column of my worksheet. And that's 188.99925. So I have my total amount that I bought throughout the entire fiscal period. I'm going to subtract what I have left at the end, and that is going to give me my cost of merchandise sold. So I'm going to subtract those two. That should give me 282,539.04. Now notice, this number magically appears under sales. Would you agree? So I have on the top my total sales, my net sales. This is the cost of my product. So remember what I told you I was selling you the monitor? The monitor was $150. The $150 is this number. This right here is the cost of that monitor, that 100. So therefore, in my world, the, the, um, the next heading, which is called gross profit on sales, would be 100. But we have to actually calculate that. So gross profit on fit sales is going to be the difference between those two, and that's going to be 262, 275, 68. Gross profit on sales. Do you need that a little bit bigger, Alexis? Yeah. Okay. How's that? Better? One more. One more. One more? How's that? Okay. Sorry. Let me know anytime if it's not big enough. I will. I will always do that. Sorry about that. Math. Subtract the two. Go down. This one. Subtract this one. Gives you that. Go down. Yes, not net income. I got a little happy in my net. Right here, yeah, that's, this is going to be, this number right here is my merchandise inventory to December 31st. That is the balance sheet column of your worksheet.
for finding my mistake on my income. There you go. Grab a treat. This is the trickiest part of this statement. I'm not going to lie. It takes you a while to memorize it. Okay? As of right now, I am contemplating letting you make a note card to help you remember this. Because if you screw that up, everything else in the test is going to go kaplooey on you. And I don't want you to lose points on that. Um, I haven't decided yet. I will decide and communicate that with Mrs. Throw for sure. I'll debate it really hard in my head. Maybe I'll have an answer tomorrow, but I don't know if I will. But I won't be able to talk to Mrs. Throw till Friday. I'll think on it. Accounting tutor, did I let you guys use a note card on that one? Yeah. I thought I gave you one at the beginning because it was because it was one of those. Because if you screw it up, it'll be off. I'm going to say yes. You can use one note card that has to be handwritten by yourself. You can't print something else and put it on there. Okay? Does that make sense? So on the test, you can use one note card for whatever notes you would like to put for the test. Strongly suggest writing down these headings and some notes about where you got them. So I'll give you that as a heads up. Yes. Okay. Giving you that as heads up, I got to remember to make sure I let Mrs. Thoreau know that. I'm running out of po I'm running out of spots to put post-it notes. Okay. So the next part is the easy part. This is where we go through and put in our heading for expenses. And guess what we do for expenses? You just really list all of your expenses, and this just takes time. And the first one is going to be advertising expense. Cash short and over. Credit card fee expense. Depreciation expense, office equipment. And all of these I'm just getting right off your worksheet. They're listed there right in order. Make sure you're getting all of your numbers for your expenses from the income statement column, not the trial balance. Why? Because some of these are adjusted, and if you take them from the trial balance, it will not be after the adjusted part. What am I doing? Six four eight seven. Now I think I got it. Okay. 
So what you will do then is you're going to add up all of your total expenses. And that number is going to go here. Now, you can't just take a number from the worksheet anymore. Why? There are other numbers in your column total, so you can't just take your column totals, giving you that as a heads up. Right here. And I'll show you in just a minute, but I'm just not putting it up there. I want people to go through and understand how it works. So you will notice things line up in a certain column because when you need it to go down and carry down, everything is there and it lines up correctly. Dylan's anxiously waiting for me to put mine up there so you can see what it is. Your, that account on your balance sheet, or on your income statement. Sugar? Yes. Federal income tax expense, it's the very last one. On line 49. Now, you will know if your income statement comes out correctly because your net income on the bottom here should equal what? It should equal this number right here. You already know what your net income is. Would you agree? So when you're going through and calculating your net income, you know you have done it correctly when these numbers equal. Does that make sense? Right here, um, Alexis, you very nicely asked that question of where I got my federal income tax expense number. Right here, line 49, I took this number right here. Because we did all of our expenses up to the 6487.89. And we've got to figure out what our net income is before taxes because that is used what we use to calculate our tax percentage. So then we put our tax then on afterwards. So we have our net income before taxes, and then we have our net income after taxes. Subtract it again. You have a whole bunch of subtractions going down. The one above. You have to go through and take your... Um, I can, but I have the answers on there, and people are just going to copy the numbers and not know how they come out. So right here, 262.75.68, subtract your net expenses, your total expenses, and it goes right here. You take these, add them up. The number goes here. This, subtract this, goes there. Your cents? On which one? Do you have 54 cents here? That is your total expenses. There you go. That's your problem. 10 cents. You keep subtracting all the way down. So you have your net income before federal income tax, which should be $77,511.14. You subtract your federal income tax expense, which they gave you in the worksheet of $14,603.79. It should give you a net income after federal income tax of $62,907.35. You always know if it comes out because you have your net income already calculated on your worksheet.
if you can't get that to come out, that's where you got to figure out where did your math mistake come in. So this bottom number here is not a mystery. It's on your worksheet. You already know what the answer is. You just have to get your numbers to work out to it. Last step on our income statement, component percentages. In the directions, they tell us we have to calculate component percentages for cost of merchandise sold, gross profit on sales, total expenses, and net income before federal income tax, round to the nearest point, 1%. So we have to take everything and divide by net sales. So if I take net sales and divide by net sales, that's going to give me 100%, and I need one decimal place. So this one is really easy because it's always 100%. Now, what I need to do using my calculator Eyes up here so I know everyone can see this. I take this number, cost of merchandise sold, and what do I do? Divide by this number. That's going to give you your component percentage, and you need one decimal place. And that number is going to go there. Did anyone calculate that one? 51.9. What does that tell us? But what is 51.9%? For every dollar I sold, 51 or 51.9 cents is the cost of the product. Does that make sense? So therefore, Taylor already went ahead. Our next one must be what? It's, what's that? 48.1. Now, 48.1, that means for every dollar sold, we make 48.1 cents profit. Every dollar that I generate. It's not net income. Profit is different than net income. Okay? We have to go through now and calculate and see what it is actually for our net income because we have to take out our expenses. So we're going to scroll down. Everything is always divided by sales. Okay? So every spot you have here, you're going to need to divide by sales. So I have my total expenses. So I'm going to take 184, 765 and divide by 544, 814, 72. And what does that tell me? What is my percentage? 33.9. So for every dollar sold, 33.9 cents covers my expenses of running my business. So we're not really making a lot of net income here. Does that make sense? So now we're going to do our net income before federal income tax because it doesn't do us any good to do afterwards. So I'm going to take my 77500 uh, 11, 14, and divide by my 544, 8, 14, 72. Again, always divide by your net sales number. And what is my component percentage? 14.2. For every dollar sold, my net income is $14 or 14.2 cent, 14 cents. You are going to have to practice this income statement. It is not going to be something you can just wing it and show up on your test next week and expect to do well, even with a note card, because you have to understand where these numbers come from. Okay? Don't worry about on your own. Okay? Let's go ahead and take a look at 14-2. Um, 14 or 15-2 is really easy. Can I do what? Fifteen two is much shorter than fifteen one, I promise you. Fifteen two is really looking at our component percentages and whether or not they're acceptable or not. So great, we calculated an income statement. So what do we do with it? Okay, 
Okay, so we have to look at our directions for this one, and this is a little bit different thinking. So in 15.1, we really looked at um, calculating an income statement, but now we have to make decisions from our income statement. This can be a little bit confusing. So we're going to go through. Interstate tires determines that no more than 53 cents or 53 percent of each sales dollar should be devoted to the cost of merchandise sold. Again, cost of merchandise sold is the cost of that monitor I want to sell you. So we need to compare the actual component percentage to the cost of merchandise sold to the acceptable. So the business said they don't want that number to be greater than 53. If it is, there's a problem on the vendors or how they're getting their cost. Okay? So we have to indicate if the actual component percentage is acceptable or unacceptable. If it's unacceptable, we have to suggest an action. Okay? So cost of merchandise sold right here. They told us, this business said no more than 53. What is our actual component percentage? Look on your direction, scroll down, you'll find it, and just plug in that no number, 51.9. Would you agree? Okay. So is it acceptable or not? Because it is not more than 53. So I'm going to go ahead and mark here. Is it, that is acceptable. Oh, I'm supposed to do a B. Sorry. And here they give us some options of what we could do if we need to do any actions. Do we need to do anything? So we're going to choose none. Now, they also tell us in the directions for our gross profit that they said that auto industry standards show at least 47% of each sale should go to gross profits. For interstate tires, we need to compare what they said. So this, again, is uh, industry standard. So the gross um, profit on sales for it, our business is actually at 48.1. Is it acceptable? Yes. So we're going to go through and put a check mark here. And then here I'm going to say none. Now we have to go through and calculate our earnings per share. Remember, this is a corporation. So instruction number three says Interstate Tires currently has 110,000 shares outstanding with a market price of $13.75 per share. So we have to calculate the earnings per share and the price earnings ratio. This is also a formula that you have to be aware of. So the first thing to do, they give us the formula here. They have our net income after federal income tax, which is 62907 In the directions, they tell us the number of shares outstanding, which is 110,000. Divide. So basically, what we're taking is our profit and dividing it between all the people that own shares of stock. And that is what your earnings per share is. And what is that value? What's that? Yep, 57. Oops, not 59. So 57 cents. If each person that owned, if each share of stock got a part of our net income, each share of stock would get 57 cents. Does that make sense? Dividing it up. But now what we need to do is we have to calcul calculate our price-earnings ratio. To calculate a price-earnings ratio, we have to go through and take our market price per share. That is the value of the stock currently being traded right now, and which is 13.75. They gave us that in our directions. Then we have to take our market or earnings per share, 0.57, which we just calculated, and that's going to give us our price-earnings ratio which is going to be 24.1. Now, the reason that we calculate our price-earnings ratio is it's going to give me a way to compare two different businesses. Okay? So instead of taking a look at the price of Apple stock, what do you think the price of Apple stock is? Greater or less than $13.75? Way greater, would you agree? When you take a look at the number of shares, do you think Apple has more shares or less shares? More. So it's really hard to compare those because it's not a really easy number. So we take a look at earnings per share also is going to be different because you have a smaller business versus a larger business. But when you calculate it and put it into phrases like price earnings ratios 
or we look at our component percentages, it allows two businesses to be compared and allows business decisions to be made. Your price earning ratio is going to be what your investors are going to look at and whether or not they want to buy your share of stock. Does that sound good? I told you two was much shorter than one. Okay. Now tomorrow for three and four, they're going to be two, not short ones, but about the same size. You're not going to have a super short one. So don't worry about the on your own portion of this. I only wanted you to do the work together with me. Got her?